I tell you, we, uh, we're looking forward to, uh, it's already been an exciting day of worship, and we're looking forward to the rest of the service being no less exciting. Uh, I'm looking forward to this afternoon and to, to get to share in a time of fellowship. Some of you we've already got to experience that with, and others uh, have, it has yet to occur, but we're looking for it today. Sister Sarah and I have had a great second week at Voice of Praise, and uh, we've, been, uh, we've been on the road quite a bit this week, uh, made some contacts with different folks and, that have been, unfortunately, been sick and in the hospital, uh, and all of them are, are, have been precious and sweet, but I, I just tell you, I uh, had the opportunity to meet brother and sister Gills this week, and uh, I think great honor goes out to them as uh, charter members of what was the Blue, Blue Well Pentecostal Holiness Church, now Voice of Praise, of course. And I just tell you, they were, they were sweethearts. And uh, uh, we went to Charleston, Brother Mike and I, to visit Brother Gill. And I shared this Wednesday night. I'll let you all in on... Uh, I, I'm, I'm, sometimes I'm transparent to a fault. But I, I, I'm learning, okay? I'm learning. I found out you don't go visiting northward in West Virginia, unless you've got $12 in your pocket. <laughs> we don't have to pay to drive in Virginia, not like that anyway, you know. But uh, I had $6, I got us to Charleston, Brother Mike had to get us back. So we thank the Lord that, that Sister Rosetta gave him some money before he left the house, you know. So. But, it, but we enjoyed, while we was up there, we... Uh, we got the phone call, or Sister Vicky text and said that uh, Sister Gills had been taken to the Princeton Hospital, and we went to see her, and she was just a, a sweetheart as well. She looked at me, she said, I'm getting ready to turn 87, Pastor. I said, well, Lord, I thought you was only about 62. She looked at my, she said, he's trying to butter me up already. <laughs> and uh, so it's, we, uh, it's been a great week, and we're, we're thankful to be here today. Uh, I, I can't help, I'm a picky person. Now that doesn't mean when it comes to eating, I'm just a picky person in that I like to pick. And I heard somebody say something about that, uh, and I, I think it was just a joke, mind you, but they said, oh, there's a, we don't have an ugly sweater contest today. And they wasn't, wasn't looking at your sweater, I, I don't think. You know. They said, we don't have an ugly sweater contest today. I said, does that mean somebody is going to wear one of those WVA shirts in this place? You know, you know I said, and then my, my friend Zach, where's Zach at? Zach comes in with his Virginia Tech coat on. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. No, I'm just picking at you. It's all in fun. This morning, I'll get a little bit closer for those of you that maybe, uh, you know, are like me and, and your arms are too short and you have to get glasses. But can, who can tell me what this is? A Coke. What is it? Coca-Cola, Coca-Cola. Mike, I'm sorry, Brother Mike, you're, you're, you're wrong. Although he, he's found out, and some of the church have found out, that Diet Dr. Pepper is my favorite, okay? I like Coke, but Coke just doesn't agree with me too well. But that is Coke. That is a bottle of Coke. How do you know it's a bottle of Coke? I ripped the name off of it. Red Lid. What, what, if, what, if, I had, what if I had did it this way? Shape of the bottle. That's pretty interesting. That's pretty interesting. Well, let me tell you a little bit about that. Back in, back in 1915, back in 1915, about the time Rick Black was born. No, not quite that long. Not, not quite that long ago, was it, Rick? Back in 1915, there was a fella named Earl R. Dean that worked for Coca-Cola. Well, actually, he didn't work for them at that time. Coca-Cola, the original soft drink, launched a campaign in 1915 to have 
or design a container, a bottle, has per se, that would trademark their product. Now, I took the time to watch some of these real old Coke commercials. I actually watched some back very, in the very much black and white era. Uh, and in that era, they actually marketed Coke as being a good, healthy, wholesome drink. And here we are some 80 or so years later... And most of us are probably obese because we had too much Coca-Cola or Pepsi or something like that. Not as wholesome as we first thought. Earl Dean worked very hard on this campaign and he designed a bottle that distinguished Coke from any other soft drink. Got a different look, different shape about it. Even with the label ripped off, I could probably even have taken the cap off and you would have still been able to identify that as being a bottle of Coke. It's a standard. We know what it is. It, it, it could be recognized. I could probably hand you that bottle in the dark. And most of you in this room could probably, just by feeling it, the shape of it with your hands, you would probably say, it's a Coke bottle. Something we're very much accustomed to, something we're used to. So in 1916, Earl Dean produced, it took him a better part of a year, and he produced this bottle that is now actually part of the trademark along with the Coca-Cola emblem of what Coke is. Okay? I still think it's better in glass bottles, by the way. I stopped last night at Go Mart or Sheets in Whitfield and uh, I was going to get one of the little ones because the little ones are always better. But I had to get that size. But it's a trademark along with the red, the red decal and the white cursive Coca-Cola written out on it. All of those things are trademark that identifies Coca-Cola as being unique to itself. It was such an accomplishment that, that Mr. Dean was offered a $500 bonus, which was quite a bit back in 1916. Or he was promised a lifetime career with Coca-Cola as long as he lived. And he took a lifetime career with Coca-Cola. Now, having said all of that, I want... To watch, I want you to watch this short video clip. Coca-Cola is such a product that they can advertise and send out their message and not even speak a word. I want you to hold that thought in your mind. As in your Bibles, you'll turn to 1 Samuel chapter 16 and verse 7. Samuel 16 in verse 7, and I'm taking text from the New International Wording. Samuel, 1 Samuel 16 and verse 7. Very familiar probably to many of you this morning. If you'll stand please in honor of the reading of God's Word. 1 Samuel 16 and 7. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height. For I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things man looks at. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Father, we thank you today, Lord, for the worship, the time that we've spent together in communion with you through worship. 
But right now, God, as we come to the place in the time of this service where we break the bread of life, God, we ask for there to be a holy anointing cover this place. Lord, we believe that the Spirit is so all-important to us, but the Spirit always will coincide with your word. And right now, Jesus, we just believe that you are ministering to us at this moment, both in spirit and in word, as we give you glory, praise, and honor, we worship you. And the church said, amen. You may be seated. Now, as we look at, at Coca-Cola to this, this morning, I want, us to, uh, I want us to think about Coke as, as in using it as an example. No, no matter what we put it in, it could be a nameless bottle. It can be the bottle, the short, stubby plastic bottles that we have today. It could be the, the classic glass bottles, or it could even be the big two liters that we find on sale at Walmart, and they go flat before we get it all drank most of the time. But, but regardless of what we consider and what we think, as we look at these bottles, uh, the bottles themselves are only the vessel in itself. Although we identify Coke with the shape of the bottle, the, the bottle itself is the vessel. Coke is actually, Coca-Cola is actually the product that is in it. Now this bottle has, each one of these bottles have unique personality. We got one that's short and fat. That reminds me of myself. We got some, it's just medium height and, and slim, like most of you, of course. And then we've got that one that is tall and fat. And I am, I'm not going to go there with that one. But, but it's, they're, they're different vessels, and, and we are a lot like that. We all are different vessels here this morning. We have different talents. We have different abilities. We look a little bit different. We all act a little bit different. We have different preferences. We have different opinions. We have all kind. there's all kinds of things that make us different. But I want you to know that this morning, that although the vessels are different, in one way we're all the same. And all of these are the same in the sense that they all have Coca-Cola in them. You see, when we as believers this morning, and if you're here and you've been born again of Jesus Christ, we may all look a little different, we may act a little different, we may uh, be different statures, we may different weights, we may have different likes, we ha may have different dislikes, but the reality of it is there is only one Spirit of God. There is only one Holy Ghost that works in our life. And regardless of the appearance, regardless of whatever it may look like, we can find ourselves being different vessels, but filled with the same product, if you would. The vessels, as I said a moment ago, universally recognizable. You can go, listen, and I've experienced this myself. You go to, uh, I, I, when I went to Kenya, I thought I was going to die because I had to drink water, you know, and I, we drank bottled water back in 2002 until I went by, we were, drove by a store, and on that store there was a Coca-Cola sign. Everybody's speaking Swahili, but when you say, you want the, you want the Coke, a Coke, it's universal. Everybody, regardless of where you go, they know what McDonald's is and they know what Coke is. I can promise you that. And, and so it's a universal. It's, listen, and I believe Christianity all over this world, I believe, I believe Christianity is a universal movement. I've, I learned through world travels on world missions type work, and, and some of you I know in this room have traveled on the missions field and done, done so many different works, in particular Rick and Latricia, but the reality of it is people may look different, they may worship different, but there is still only one God that those people will worship. There's only one true and living God, let me put it that way. But I found out that just like it is here in America, and probably worse, once you've taken what's in one of these bottles and you've consumed it, you end up with an empty bottle. Now, unless you're like my mama was with 
Ritz pie pans and Cool Whip bowls. Any any of y'all know what I'm talking about to say? Those Ritz, those aluminum pie pans. Lord, you can't throw them things away, honey. And them Cool Whip bowls. Why them Cool Whip bowls? And you know, you got the stack over there on the corner of the cabinet this tall. You open the doors and they just, you know, it's like a Cool Whip bowl avalanche just fell right on top of you. I'm glad y'all, I'm glad West Virginia people like they are in Virginia because y'all know what I'm talking about. But I, I don't find too many people saving Coke bottles. There may be somebody that's saving them along the way, maybe for recycling. Not too many people are, are saving those bottles. But in other words, what is valuable to people is what's inside these bottles. That's what becomes valuable to people. What becomes valuable to people with us is not so much as who we are on the outside, but what we are on the inside. Are you with me? It's not what we are on the outside, but it's what we are on the inside. So, so the soda that bears the Coca-Cola formula is what people are desiring. That's what they're looking for. That's what they're wanting. That's what they need. And I promise you, I promise you, I'm not a Coca-Cola drinker. I'm a Diet Dr. Pepper drinker. But I promise you, you could put Pepsi in a Coke bottle and a good Coke drinker is going to say to you, that's not Coke. You can put anything else in that bottle and a good Coke drinker, a person that identifies with Coca-Cola will say, this is not Coca-Cola. Somebody snuck something in on me. Somebody's changed it up. They must have messed up at the bottler. The Coke has a, a unique taste, and it has just a unique smell to it, if you would. In fact, it's so unique that, that, that most of us, if, and, and this is, this is diet, Sister Sarah does Diet Coke. That's how I ended up with the Diet Coke bottle. Now, now this, is, this is a Diet Coke bottle. And it's got the Diet Coke label on it. Who likes Diet Coke? Who does? Miss Elaine, you like Diet Coke. Bless your heart. You want to taste, you want to taste test this for me? You don't really have to. You can just smell of it. Ew. Say what? Ew. Well, that's the way I feel about it, too. Ew. Who else like Diet Coke? Who else said they like Diet Coke? Y'all, y'all putting your hands down now. I don't move about here. You putting your hands down now because this cause she said, ooh. Ooh, ooh, it's not always bad. Here, see what you think. See what you think. New, the new taste of Diet Coke. What'd you say? What? Oh, oh, you just didn't say anything. The, the new taste of Diet Coke. The new taste, the new look of Diet Coke, but nobody wants it. You know why? Because it's, it, because it's not Coke at all. That's actually Walmart brand of uh, great value brand, apple cider vinegar, okay? If you're eating greens, it's good. But it doesn't fit the bill if you're thirsty. What's in that bottle will not fit the bill of Coca-Cola. It looks like vinegar, now that I've told you. It tastes like vinegar. And it smells like vinegar. It is definitely not Coca-Cola. Collard greens, you're in good shape. But if you're thirsty, you out of luck. So when we begin to look and consider the container again, it's not necessarily the container, but it's what's in that container. You see, and that's, that's the work of God in our life. I've called this message the real thing. Now, if I, if I want a Coke, I'm not, I'm not going to pick up one like this. If I go in a store, in fact, some of you that are old enough will remember a few years ago, ago when they came out with the new Coke. You remember that? It was in a different bottle. It had a different taste. It didn't last but about six months because, no, because people said, that's not Coke. That tastes like Pepsi. We, if we want a Coke, we want a Coke. And Coca-Cola actually used the slogan in their advertising campaign, it's the real thing, what the world needs today. Y'all remember that? And the reality of it is, listen to me very carefully right now. We live in a, we live in a society and an age 
where the, the, the church has been through some powerful seasons in times past. And let me say this as a disclaimer. The, the true church of the living God, the true church has always existed and there always will be a true church. But I struggle and I have to differentiate sometimes between church and religion or the true church and religion. Religion has always been a factor in Christianity. It is considered a religion. Jesus dealt with religion as he dealt with the Jews. He, he, uh, he encountered their religious, their Old Testament beliefs, if you would. We find that even today that sometimes in spite of us, you know, we used to, us Pentecostals, we would sometimes criticize the Presbyterians and the Lutherans and the Methodists and, and the Episcopalians and whomever else that we could, uh, we could appoint a finger at and accuse them of just being so religious and, and, and not flowing in the Spirit. But the reality of it is, even us Pentecostals have taken on a certain amount of religion and forms and fashions. You see, it's not about, but it's not about the bottle. It's, it's not about that. It's not about coming to a certain form and fashion. Now, that man, he made a, he made a lot, he had a lifelong career just because he formed the shape of, of a glass bottle. He has a lifelong career, but the reality of it is, it, the bottle, it was important from a marketing standpoint, but it wasn't the product at all, because without the product, the bottle would be meaningless. You see, where I'm going with this this morning is, you and I, we need to, to, to push aside forms and fashions of religion. We need to push aside traditions. We need to push aside, well, we've, we've always done it this way. And I, I had a lady one time, I was teaching a class on the gifts of the Spirit. And I had this lady said, well, she said, I just, I can tell when the Holy Ghost is on somebody. I said, really? I said, would you like to share that? She said, oh, yeah. She said, you can tell because your lips get really white. And we begin to try to make everyone fit into our mold and into our shape and into our model. If they don't worship like the, us, then they must not be one of us. If they don't, maybe they're a suit and tie in church and we're a, a blue jean and t-shirt church, so they must not be like us. But the reality of it is, it's, it's not about that container. It's about what's inside that container. You see, because I can take the container and I can pull, fill it full of apple cider vinegar. Good for greens and spinach and whatever else you may like to eat it on. But the reality of it is, nobody in this room is probably going to want that unless you brought a pot of greens for lunch. The fact of the matter is, what is desired is inside. And, and it's time that we as the church realize that people are looking for something real. It's the real thing. Listen, we sat back as a church, and, and, and you know, I'm one of us too, okay? But we sit back as a church. How many times do we sit back and say, Lord, people just don't come to church like they used to. People just don't want to come to church like they used to and worship the Lord. And we've said remarks along that line thinking that, you know, that everybody else has gone by the way of sin and de-degradation and they no longer love God. But a lot of times when you get talking to people, you'll find statistics says that, that eight out of ten people are just waiting on somebody to ask them to come to church. Different message, but let me give you another little disclaimer. Just going out and asking somebody to come to church is not really personal Christian witness. It's good, and it has its place, but that's not soul winning. But eight out of ten people, if somebody would just ask them to come to church, says they would come. But here's the reality. Those people also, those eight out of ten people also say, 
when I get to church, I want it to be something real. I want it to be something real. I just don't want a bottle, an empty bottle. I don't want a bottle or a bottle full of vinegar. Just It looks the part. It's got the shape. It acts the part. But I want it to be real. I want, I want, real, I want to worship with real people that are worshiping a real God. You know, and, and, and has God looked upon David in the, the scripture we took text from? God looks upon David and he, and he says this, he looks at his older brothers. These, these are not the ones I've chosen at all. I want the, I want that one. I want the little red-headed, ruddy-faced boy out in the field. I want that one. I don't want that one that, that you haven't even given thought to, Jesse. I want him because he is real. There is something inside of him. There is something that is turning over. There is something that is moving. There is something that is working in the life of David. People are looking for the real thing. But not only are people looking for the real thing, God is looking for the real thing in us. He's looking for a heart that is pure. He's looking for a heart that desires him. He's looking, you know, and we think about that scripture that where our desires are, that's where our heart is also. The, the, the thing that, draw, that drives us, the thing that, that, that pushes us in whatever direction we're going. You know, if you want to know, if you want to know where your heart is, look at what you're driven to. If you want to cross-examine your heart, look at what is most important to you. If you want to know what is, what, where your heart is, well, I hope my heart is right with God. Well, well, examine your heart. What, what is driving you? What pushes you? Is it the things of God? Is it to pursue the heart of God? Or, or is it maybe other things? And, and listen, there's a lot of things that we can have and enjoy and do in life, but that are, that are not sinful to us. But in reality, anything I believe can become sin to us. Whenever we let it come between us and God, or it comes before us in our life. You see, when, when Paul wrote that letter to the Romans church, and we use it as part of the Roman road of salvation, and, and, and Romans, in Romans, he, he talks about that when, when we proclaim Jesus as Lord of our life, when we proclaim Jesus as Lord of our life, that word Lord in itself means this. You have rule and reign over my life. So is, is Jesus actually in rule and reign over our life? Is, is he our motivation? Is, is, is he, do, do we, hey, listen, you don't say, oh Lord, that, that pastor, he's one of these crazy fundamentalist preachers. Uh, probably so. Uh, uh, but, 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 but are we, do we eat Jesus? Do we sleep Jesus? Do we thank Jesus? Do we have our mind on the things of Christ? Or, you know, every, every day in our life, every passing moment, I don't care. Some of you may, some of you may be digging in the, in the coal mines. Some of you may be serving at, at Wendy's or at McDonald's. Some of you may be retired and just going down to Hardy's and sit around and eat ham biscuits and drink coffee every morning. But wherever you're at, listen to me, our, if our hearts are centered upon God and we are focused on the real thing, then we can impart what we have. Remember, remember what the disciple said? He said to that lame man, he says, silver and gold, I don't have any, but what I do have, I give to you. Do we have what we need to have to impart into the lives of other people? Are we offering them the real thing? When people walk into voice of praise, is it the real thing? When people walk into your home, is it the real thing? Now, I can take this Coke and pour it into another bottle and it's still going to be Coke. I can pour it into a cup, it's going to be Coke. I can do a lot of different things with it, but it's still going to be Coke. 
it would be foolish for us to say, well, since it's no longer in the bottle anymore, it's not Coke. Because although the bottle does have relevancy visually to us, the bottle's not what the product is. It would be foolish for us to say, well, just because we don't do it the way we used to, or just because we don't sing it the way we used to, just because, whatever, just because, I don't believe it's really Coke anymore. I don't believe it's really the Spirit of God anymore. That would be foolish for us to think of. That would be foolish for us to have that attitude. Because understanding that, that, that the holiness of God is unchanging. The, the, the message is unchanging, but methodologies have changed through the years. You see, used to, the only thing you could get was the little glass bottles or one of these. But now we've got these size bottles. We've got the little plastic bottles. We've got the, the two liters, and you can get three liters, and you can get one liters, and you can get cans. And, and Coke was very smart because they knew if they kept doing this and this only that they would lose market share. So they didn't change the message, the product. They just changed the methodology just a little bit. Because there's some people like Miss Elaine that maybe wants a glass bottle. No drinking in the sanctuary, sister, okay? There's some people like Sister Wise that may like a, a plastic bottle. Can you catch? Then who's real thirsty? Nobody's real thirsty this morning? Nathan's real thirsty? <laughs> He's dying of thirst. Then there may be somebody who's, who says, it don't matter to me if the label's gone off of it or not. You know, you know I, anybody cares whether it's got the label or not? <coughs> so, so we find ourselves, now, but does anybody want the bottle of vinegar? <laughs> What's your name? Karen, you are truly blonde, aren't you? <laughs> Give that to her. It works for cleaning too, okay. Okay, Coca-Cola actually works good to clean windshields with as well, if you never... But the reality of it is, people are looking for the real thing. They want the real thing out of us, church. They want us to be real. They want us to be, they want us to be what we say we are. They want us to do what we say we will do. They want us to be people of God. That's what they expect of us. And that's what they're looking for. As, identifi as identifiable as it is, it's not the bottle that makes Coca-Cola. It's the Coke in the bottle. Listen. I believe that godly people in some manner will have distinguishable characteristics. I still believe, I'm still a little bit old school, okay? I still believe, now we don't have to have granny buns and long sleeve shirts. But I do believe that God's people will be identifiable. Not only in our deeds, but also in our spirits, in our personalities, in our actions. You see, because it has been said that, that all of us need to preach the gospel and if necessary, even use words to do so. 
You see, our lives should be depictions. We, I had somebody get mad at me one time. I said this. So don't, if you get mad at me, and Lord, forgive me. But the reality of it is, all, every one of us in this room that, that profess, professes Christ as our Savior, we are called to be little Jesuses. Now that doesn't mean we, we, we walk in his, in his deity, if you would. But the reality of it is, we are called to be little Jesuses. We're, we're, to, we're to look like Coke. But we look like Coke because what inside of us is Coke. We, we look like, we act like we have the personality of Jesus not because we're trying to conform to a fashion or a form because we can do that and still deny the power thereof according to Scripture. But the reality of it is, it's when the, it's when the real thing is inside of us. He just looked thirsty. When the real thing is inside of us, the outside will become identifiable with it as well. I believe that. I believe that. And the world will be, begin to look for the real thing. The real thing. There you go, Barry. Uh-oh. <laughs> Don't open it in the church. It's on spew. The real thing. The real thing. The real thing. Because let me tell you, Coke came out with a different product, as I said a few years ago. But the truth of the matter is, the truth of the matter is, the people of the world wanted the real thing. And so it is with our life. God looked at David he said, I want him because his heart is pure and right with me. Whitney, if you'd like to come back. And God is looking at us, and out of all that he could desire, out of all that he could want of us, I'm a churchman. I believe in attending church. I believe that if you're a Christian, that you should attend church. But, out of, but, but even beyond that, it's not just about going to church. It's not just about, about being religious and listening to Christian radio and, and having that bumper sticker on your car that says, Jesus is my co-pilot. Some of you know, probably not many of you, years ago, I ran, I, for about nine years, I ran, my own, I ran a body shop business. And through those nine years, I, I, built, I built up a, uh, a base of customers and, you know, they would be, some of them, bless their hearts, would be repeat customers. And I remember this one little lady, Pentecostal lady, she would come to me, she had a Ford Taurus, and she would bring her Ford Taurus to me just every few months because she had had an accident. On one corner of the rear bumper, she had Jesus is my co-pilot. On the other corner of her bumper, it says, the angels of the Lord are riding with me. The guy that worked for me, or one of the guys that worked for me, he was not a Christian, although he was raised in church. He looked at me and he said, I want to tell you something. If them angels are smart, they don't get out of that car before she kills them. So no matter if you got the bumper stickers on your car, and it's all right, there's nothing wrong with that. You may be wearing I love Jesus hat or your belt buckle. You might have guardian angels, magnets all over your refrigerator door. You may listen to nothing but Christian radio. All that's well and all that's good, okay? I'm not criticizing that. You may come to church every single time that the doors are open and you have the opportunity. But let me tell you what God is looking for. Above and beyond all of those things, He's looking for the real thing in your life. He's looking for your heart to be conformed His product his product. 
Coca-Cola is actually blended in a formula. God wants you to have His formula in your life. He wants you to have and He wants you to be the real thing. And when you become, the, when you and I become the real thing, there, there's, there's something about us. There, people are going to, uh, to visually behold us and, and realize that's the real thing. Not about who we are on the outside, but who we are on the inside. But then as we're poured out, when you pour that Coca-Cola out and you pour it over the ice cubes in that cup it's, and you take that sip of that Coca-Cola, you realize this is the real stuff. As you and I are poured out before the rest of the people that we encounter every single day. Listen, being really frank with you right now, your church people don't know how much of Jesus you have, but the people you work with on your job do. That woman that just cut the light off in the Walmart line after you've stood there 20 minutes, she knows how much of Jesus that you have. I used to have a bad habit of, as they say, giving people a piece of my mind. I've given so much of it away that I'm now deficient. The Lord's had to help me with that. But listen, what I'm saying to you, and I love to make you laugh. Don't misunderstand me, but I'm very serious this morning. God wants us to have and to be the real thing. He wants us to be genuine. Genuinely in love with Him and genuinely broadcasting His love abroad. The real thing. Not an imitation. Not just some Coke bottle full of vinegar. Maybe you don't carry the label. But God wants us to be the real thing. The real thing. People are looking for that. The world, the world is looking that. They expect that of us. I think it was Sister Pam that said, or that said, no, none of us have been zapped into perfection, and I'm not one of those legalists that's going to tell you you got you can't, you can't, you can't, you can't, you got to do this, you got to do that. I'm not that way at all. But the reality of it is, we're representatives of the kingdom of God. Representatives of the kingdom of God in a world that is looking for the real thing. I want you to just bow your heads with me just for a moment. You may be here this morning and maybe you've been going through some tough times. Maybe you, perhaps you've had some troubles, some struggles. You know, when I first got saved, I, you know, my, I was the first one in my family to get saved. And, and I, I got all kind of advice from, from parents that, that didn't even know what being saved was about. And my mom would tell me things like, son, you can't be a Christian if you don't get mad. Or son, you can't do this, you can't go here, you can't go there. I walked in a lot of years of defeat until I realized I come to that, that point, my, that realization that my, my Christian life, my Christian experience is about my relationship with Jesus Christ. And when my relationship with Jesus Christ is, is right, then all the other things begin to fall in place. And I'm of the notion that's the way it is or should be in all of our lives. You may be here this morning and, and you may be finding living the Christian life a struggle. You may be finding it so, sort of difficult at times. But I want you to know God wants, God wants you to have the real thing. I used to live my life 
Every, every time I, I went out of the house, I was like the, the little chicken, the story of the little chicken and the skies falling. I, I, was, I was so paranoid of backsliding. I, I, had, I didn't have a lot of confidence in my relationship with Jesus Christ. Basically because I was unlearned and ignorant to it. But I'm here to announce to you this morning, you can have the real thing. You can be the real thing. And God can bring you to that place in your life, in your walk, in your experience, where you can walk and live and witness for Christ in the confidence that you're in right relationship with Him. So some of you here this morning, you may be struggling. You may be struggling. Maybe the enemies even talk to you and say, oh, you're really not a Christian. Well, he's a liar. I can promise you God's not telling you that. But maybe you're here this morning, just maybe, and you realize, I need the real thing. I want to be the real thing. I want to pursue the real thing. I want to be genuine in Jesus. If that's you, not condemning you, not criticizing you, not finding fault with you, but if that's you right now and you feel like sometimes that your whole Christian life, like you've just really been faking it, I want you to slip up your hand and say, pray for me. Is there anybody in this room right now? Young or old? Nobody's looking around. I need to know. Thank you. Is there anybody else? I need to know. I want to know that I'm genuine. I want to know that I have the real thing. Any others? Real quick. This is what I want to ask you to do. I want everybody in this church that can and will. I, was, I read a quote by Jim Cimbala last night. Jim Cimbala said, When the altars are, don't worry about filling the pews. When the altar is full, then the pews will fill. So I'm going to ask all of you to come down here to the altar. Pam, if you all like to, to bring some vocals, would be great. If you raised your hand, and there was a couple of you in this congregation this morning that raised your hand, I want to know, I want to know I, that I have the real thing. I, I don't believe in hope so salvation. I don't believe in I think so. I believe that we can know beyond the shadow of a doubt. We can know that we know that we know where we're at with God. Y'all come on up here. I'm, I, come on up here and make plenty of room so everybody can get in there. And if, you ra if you're one of those that raised your hand, if you, if you would like to make your way up front here at some point in time, I would like to share something with you from the Scripture, and I would like to pray with you along with everybody else. Let me tell you, this morning, voice of praise. There's not, a per there's not a single one of us in this room that doesn't need the real thing. There's not a one of us in this room that doesn't need the real thing. And I'm not talking about Coca-Cola. We need the real thing. We need that experience of God. We need that movement of God in our life. So this morning we're going to pray. And again, if you were one of those that slipped up your hand or maybe you were little hesitant to slip your hand up for prayer but you want special prayer this morning I'm just going to ask you to make your way up and, and because we want to join with you in prayer because everybody else in this room is standing is standing or has stood where you're standing right now so I want you right now I want you to do with this with me as a sign of unity I want you to grab hands with the person next to you and right now we are going to pray if there's things that we need to repent of, if there's things that we just ask, we need to ask the Lord's forgiveness of, but if there's something that that it may, there's something that's been been hanging around in your heart for a long time, let go of. But we're going to go before God and we're going to say, God, I want to be the real thing, and I need you. Because when you and you and you and you and you and you 
when we all have become the real thing guess what happens voice of praise becomes the real thing the real deal eight out of ten people are looking for something real I don't know what the population is around here but I'm sure if you take eight out of ten this will be a pretty good crowd we're probably not going to be able to handle them but we'll work with them okay we'll deal with that when the time comes so right now let's just pray before God join me together in prayer Father as we come to you we love you and we worship you and we bless you today and Lord right now today Lord as we come before you Lord it's our desire to be the real thing it's our desire Lord to be genuine Lord before you Lord you know the deep recesses of my heart just like you knew David's heart as he was out in the field Lord God you looked upon him and you saw the love that and the compassion that he had for you and God right now as, in as much as you know our hearts and you know our lives Lord we come to you if there's anything Lord Lord that we should seek your forgiveness for God right now Lord we come to you and ask you to forgive us maybe we've just been slothful in prayer maybe maybe we've been slothful in worship maybe there's hardness or bitterness in our heart towards another person God maybe there's something that, that's just lingered there for a long long time but today God I choose to release it to you Lord I ask that you help me to walk in repentance Lord God Lord that I, my, my pathway will be changed I will walk in a different direction Lord I submit myself to you and God right now I'm asking that you Lord for you are the true and the living Lord you are the real thing Lord you are the only one true and living God and right now Jesus I'm asking Lord that you will fill us with your Holy Spirit God that we will be filled with the genuine Spirit of Christ and Lord that we Lord will be the real thing I will be the witness Lord God that you've called me to be I will be that vessel Lord of servants that, that, that you've called me to be Lord I will I will be Lord God that child that son that daughter of God that you've called me to be I will be genuine in my walk with you I will not try to fake it any longer I will not Lord try try to just muddle my way through but God I'm determined this determined this morning that I'm going to be real before you so that you can be real in me God, when that happens, Lord, voice of praise will become more real than it's ever been in this community. And we will touch the hearts and lives of people throughout Bluewell, Brush Fork, McDowell, wherever it's, wherever we can, Welch, Princeton, God. To the far reaches of the earth it will be said that those people at voice of praise are for real they're for real and their hearts are centered upon the Lord God Almighty so right now Jesus I decree and declare over this our church family that we'll be more than just a trademark vessel. But Lord, we will contain. It'll be more than just our sign out on the road. It'll be more than a building of brick and stone. But we will contain the realness of God. And we will meet the thirst of a lost and dying world. In Jesus' name we pray. Jesus name we pray right now. Amen. Amen. Now of those that that slipped your hand up, or is there any of you that we could share with just a moment in the word and in prayer? Because see part of the reason I'm here is to help people succeed in having a relationship with Jesus Christ. That's what I want to do. That's what I want Voice of Praise to be about. So is there anybody that would like just a moment of some counsel and prayer? Anybody need prayer in your body this morning before we leave? Or, or another?
another circumstance that we can pray over.